for me, I'm to see it. Thanks, Mom. Let me start a moment. I'm just going to give the door a chance to put a bow and all that. Give us one minute. We're all set, so we are ready to proceed on the case of the United States versus Crosby. Well, is everybody up for the proceedings? Are there any preliminary matters uh, for the court to address? Yes, um, first, the application of the file. Yeah, let me hear your introduction of both, and then I'll come back to you for any preliminary questions. Good morning. My name is Sam Farnford, and I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Mr. Lefferts. Good morning. Good morning. And at Council table, we're also joined by Secret Service agent Morgan Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Austin. I'm going to today with my colleague, Ms. Jessica Allen. Good morning, Your Honor. Together, we represent the defendant in today's case, Mr. Blake Rossi. Good morning. We also have a little bit of a story. I'll be right after I get to Of course. Yes, Your Honor. First, we move to the vote of 603, following the constructive square and the columns before the case. That'd be We'd also like to ask for preference to the rule committee as well. Would you like us to ask the commission for approaching the witness and your honor and the jury or just stay what we're doing prior? Just stay what you're doing. Do what you do best as well as as you see fit. I want to see the best at both these. So do what you want to do. Yes, yeah. stay at the record. With that, we're ready to go. Great. We just want to draw the court's attention to the fact that we need to see the team work in the same time as we did today's case. So we think that we're all going to have that's fine. I'm just a free one. Of course. We're ready to go. Wonderful. All right, with that, all right, you can see the opening whenever you're ready. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. The marksman hit his mark. It's July 4th, 2022. And Senator Tom Capello is hosting a rally of his presidential campaign. The crowd is jam-packed. Children are waving American flags. Parents are passing out campaign flyers. And everybody is chanting Senator Capello's name. It seems like a classic Independence Day rally. But then a shot comes in. Senator Capello's head snaps backward, blood pours down his face, and his body crumbles to the ground. He's been assassinated. The marksman hit his mark. Because if you see, not everybody believes that Senator Capello should be president. And for a lone marksman, this defendant. Senator Capello wasn't just a bad candidate. He was a threat to every person in this country. And that's why you'll learn on the 4th of July, he went to the rooftop of the Sinesta Hotel, pulled out a sniper rifle, and fired a bullet over 600 yards until he met into Marble, dead center of Senator Capello's war. 
the marksman hit his mark. And that's why we've charged the defendant with murder today. That means as the government, we bear a burden of proof. We have to prove to you that the defendant killed Senator Capello intentionally. And we're going to meet our burden with three simple facts. Fact one, what the defendant did. Two, why he did it. And three, how he did it. Let's break those down one at a time, starting with fact one. What did the defendant do? You're going to hear from Secret Service agent Morgan Duby. She was with Senator Capello when he was shot, and she'll tell you about the investigation into his death. She'll walk through the forensics that tell us who the marksman actually was. She'll show you a bullet that matches the same kind of bullet used to kill Senator Capella. And you'll learn that bullet was found on the rooftop of the Sinesco Hotel, the same hotel in which the defendant was staying. And you'll learn that next to that bullet, there was a cigarette with three things on it. The defendant's DNA, the defendant's fingerprint, and a gunshot that brings us to fact two. Why the defendant did this? Because we're going to show you a tweet the defendant posted, showing their political views about Senator Capello. And you're going to learn this wasn't just a political disagreement. The defendant thought Senator Capello was a threat to this entire country and that no one was safe while he was alive. You're going to see that was the reason the defendant made Senator Capello his mother. Fact three. How the defendant did this? Because you're going to learn this shooting was done by a skilled marksman, a trained sniper, who was able to kill Senator Capello from over 600 yards away. That's not an easy shot. You're going to learn this defendant is a trained marksman. That he served for the United States military in the sniper and he had the skill and experience needed to hit his father. The marksman hit his mom. Members of the jury, the defendant shot Senator Capello from a distance from 600 yards today. But today, you're going to see the evidence up close. If you examine the facts, we're confident that you'll see the defendant murder a second. That's why we're going to ask you to find him guilty at the end of this trial. Thank you. May it please the court, Mr. Cornford. Members of the jury, they couldn't find the shooting, but they need in it. It's July 4th, 2022. And Secret Service agent Morgan DeVito is standing in the green house. Wow. Is presidential candidate Thomas Capella. She stands looking for the glint of a knife or a pistol that's too late. 21 years on the job and she still gets that hate in her stomach. Her attention snaps to the candidate behind her as she hears the pop of a good shot. Secret Service hasn't lost a presidential candidate since 1968. Until today. On her. She can't see the shooter. She's surrounded by thousands of people. There's thousands more in the surrounding buildings. She can see the headlines now. Thomas Capello assassinated where? was the secret service. She's not a homicide detective, but she needs to find him. 
Nancy. Two hours later. The phone rings. The hotel employee says, someone tried to see me. That agent might have not found the shoe. But you'll learn she certainly found her answer. Because today, that person who tried to go on to the roof is on trial for the murder of a major presidential. And when these prosecutors chose to bring those charges against Mr. Foster, they took on the According to prove their case beyond. All the reasonable doubt at the end of this trial, their story has to be the only reasonable story. It's the heaviest burden in our legal system, members of the jury, and it's certainly not what the government is going to be able to beat. But this is what we're going to do today's trial. We're going to ask you to pay attention to three holes in the government's case. They just can't explain fully. No one would think in a murder trial there would be a murder one. Mr. Farnsworth talks about a marksman, but a marksman needs a gun. And you'll hear that the gun that was used in this case, it wasn't just a gun. It was a military grade sniper. You're not going to see a sniper. You're not even going to see a picture of one long. The Secret Service never found it. You're not going to hear from anyone or see anything that will show you Mr. Crosby had access to that kind of gun at all, much less in Philadelphia on the 4th of July. No. You see, the Secret Service, they talk to a lot of people over the course of this investigation, but you're not going to hear from one of them that says, well, I saw Mr. Crosby on the roof of the Sinesta with a rifle in his hand. Or even, I saw Mr. Crosby with a rifle in Philadelphia, much less I saw Mr. Crosby pull the trigger. Is that a hotel? You said Mr. Crosby tried to go on to the roof to smoke. And when she told him it was employees only, turned back. That's it. So that brings us to fact number three. The government doesn't have a plan. These things are going to work. Maybe you believe me. And this was not a healthy plan. All the evidence was hidden. There were no cameras in the stairwell. There was no ID to get onto the rooftop. But I don't want you to hear from any evidence that we should possibly would have known about anything. Before he stepped foot in Philadelphia. We expect you all here. Both. Mr. Cross will be the first to do. He didn't like Mr. Capella. But today he's going to waive his Fifth Amendment right not to testify to tell you that he certainly didn't kill him. That would keep shot. Witness saw him. He saw him there because that's where he was. And he won't be here today. Because the Secret Service just couldn't accept it. And all Mr. Crosby is guilty of is protesting in Philadelphia. They couldn't find the shooting. They needed an answer. So they picked one. That's why at the end of this trial, we're going to ask you to find Mr. Crosby not guilty. Thank you.
Yes, Your Honor, I think what we do now in law where it's been 16 in evidence, it's an FBI forensic report, and it was typically in 16 in all American companies. Thank you, Your Honor. That's our decision, Your Honor. We have the evidence. Great. We'll accept that. For me, it's a public match. I have a copy, so if you want to keep it for use, I have a case in front of me. We call each organ to be governed. Good morning. Please introduce yourself to the members of the jury. Good morning. I'm Agent Morgan Dubico. What do you do for a living, Agent? I'm a special agent for the Secret Service. I'm in the protection unit. How long have you worked in the Secret Service? About 21 years. And could you tell the jury what you actually do as a Secret Service agent? Of course. So in the protection unit, we're charged with protecting important figures, usually politicians. But I also work in the investigation, which means when one of those politicians is killed, I'm a part of that investigation. You said that you're part of the investigation is when a politician is supposed to protect is killed. Has that ever happened? It has. Why? Last year, on July 4th, 2022, Senator Thomas Pello was killed. I was the lead investigator in that case. I want to talk about how that investigation began. Where were you when Senator Pello was shot? I was charged with Senator Pello's protection, so I was at the rally on July 4th. And what did you see at the rally? I was in the crowd, so I saw Senator Pello on stage, and then I heard a gunshot, and I saw him fall to the ground. After you saw Senator Pello fall to the ground, what did you do? I drew my weapon. I looked around for a shooter, and I rushed to the stage. What did you see on stage? I saw that Senator Pello had been shot in the forehead. By the time I got there, he was already dead. Agent, let's talk a little bit about your investigation into that senator's death. Did you work with any other agencies in this investigation? I did. The Secret Service worked with the FBI. How did the FBI factor into your search? So Agent Joe Wooden from the FBI's forensic investigator, we had to test the evidence we found so we could have a forensic report as well as just that physical evidence. Agent, where's your investigation actually start with the FBI? So we started by looking into where that shot might have been fired. How did you do that? We asked Agent Wooden if she could look into the angle and the vantage point based on where that bullet entered the center of the head. We were able to narrow it down to about five buildings. Did you search every one of those buildings? Of course. We searched all of them. What'd you find? We found that only one of those five buildings had any evidence that connected it to this assassination. The Sinesta Hotel in Rittenhouse Square. Agent, what did you find at the Sinesta Hotel? On the roof of that hotel, we found a bullet and a cigarette. Would you recognize that bullet and cigarette butt if I showed it to you now? I would. I'm approaching the witness with you since five seconds. Go. Agent, what did I just say? So this is that bullet that we recovered from the Sinestra Hotel room. And this is the cigarette bullet. Were you able to connect either of these pieces of evidence to the crime? We were. This bullet was the same kind of bullet that was used to kill Senator Pello. And this cigarette had gunshot revenue. At this time, the government moves exhibits five and seven in evidence. Any objection to the pilot's up? Without objection. We'll accept the piece of evidence. Were you able to tie either of these pieces of evidence to a marksman? We were. We sent both of these pieces of evidence to Agent Wooden. While the bullet didn't have any forensic evidence on it, this cigarette that was laying nearby had fingerprints and DNA. 
projection wrong, it's your lack of foundation for any of this report, this report is optional as well, not the engagement in full studies, it's the benefit to a loss. What we don't need to get into the team from the time, our fascist, let's say over that, I mean, if I made a problem, it is on the ledge for the entire day. And because of that, it could have gotten that function, it could have been tied to a specific more extended, and that's what we're speaking about in this next year. That is what we're going to do. Response? Yes, uh, two responses. First, we don't agree that cigarette is on the root cause for an entire day. And second, there is circumstantial evidence connecting that fully to the cigarette. The proposal has been to put on these issues on cross examination, and, but this is an issue of weight and not flexibility. We're going to tie more evidence actually connecting these two pieces of evidence, including gunshot flexibility as well. Yes. If there's circumstances that are in between two pieces of that, and we need to hear that foundation of what it is, it's all the same. We want to hear that foundation on the records to ensure we can know how she's making this record. Response? Maybe one for this. Yes, Your Honor. The witness has an offer to conclusion that only stated that she found DNA and a fingerprint on a cigarette. We'll keep walking through her steps and her foundation before getting into any accidents. Thank you. Brief response, though. No, I'm going to sustain the objection. Uh, I think she is offering a limited uh, conclusion as to making it for Marksman. We certainly lay the foundation for how she's able to make that, but until that's made, I'm going to sustain the objection. Motion for yes, I'm back on uh, the Yes, that's linked to Marksman. Yes, sir. Agent, were you able to connect that cigarette with any suspect? We were. When we sent that cigarette off for testing, we found DNA evidence as well as fingerprints. And were you able to connect that cigarette to the bullet? We were. We found gunshot residue on that cigarette, which indicated that it was within five feet of a fire when it was discharged. Objection, Norm. So I have a foundation again. I mean, Norm, the specific question is how he was able to link the cigarette that was the bullet. But Norm, we just heard that it was within five minutes of the fire. There's a lot of foundation of how the bullet specifically that was found on the top is connected to the cigarette. Again, we draw our into the seat when that cigarette was there. You have that one shot resident fell on. So the question that Mr. Barnes would ask, then the answer is that his age is controlling the lack of foundation given. Yes, Your Honor, there's sufficient foundation on the record. The fact that there was gunshot residue found on the cigarette is enough to connect that cigarette to a bullet found in the cigarette. The opposing counsel again wants to bring up these issues on the cross again, but there's a proper foundation on the record for this testimony. There's also, again, just because the cigarette had a bunch of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from that bullet. There are a lot of people in here who have reasons for putting it in a bunch of it, including the fact that Mr. Rossi left the day before, and one of them did assassinate Thomas Keller, shot from the exact same location. That's not the foundation of the record. Say it conclusively lists the cigarette with a specific bullet and made that one. Yes, Your Honor. There is no, it doesn't sound like a public counsel is disputing that the gun was fired from that bullet. They're just disputing the time. If that's the case, the foundation on the record that that cigarette was connected to the bullet is sufficient. He can bring up the fact that we can't know when the gunshot residue was placed on the cigarette in, in his view of the evidence. On cross examination, but the foundation is there for this testimony as given. Is there any document already created uh, saying uh, an expert conclusion saying that the bullet was linked uh, to the cigarette? The bullet, that the bullet was linked to the cigarette? Yeah. There's the fact that uh, I think it's expected. Line A of the offered exhibit says that exhibit seven has a positive for the gunshot residue. Indicating cigarette must have been present at time of and with five, within five feet of discharge of the fire. That's the only one. That's one thought. What is it? 16. Any other questions? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. I'm going to sustain the objection. I think the language, uh, I was, you can certainly bring up that it was from a drunk gun. I don't think there's enough evidence uh, on the record yet that it's linked to this specific bullet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to describe that. Let me try. Yes, sir. Agent DeVito, were you able to see if that cigarette was near a firearm at any point in time? We were. It tested positive for gunshot residue that said it was within five feet of a firearm that was discharged. 
You said that cigarette had a fingerprint DNA evidence on it. Whose fingerprint and DNA did you find on that cigarette? We found that the DNA on that cigarette was a one in 6.2 billion match to the defendant, Blake Cross. Let's talk about your investigation. Were you able to determine why he may have committed this crime? We were. When we looked into Mr. Crosby's background, we found some tweets he had made about the matter of the Would you recognize those tweets by show them? I will. Approaching the witness with exhibit one. Thank you. What did I say? These are those tweets made by the defendant. Do they look fair and accurate? They do. We offer to the public. Any judgment to the public? Without objection, no. For all objections, it's a Permission to publish to the jury. Yeah. Agent, could you read what the defendant posted on Twitter to the jury? Of course. It says Thomas R. Pello is a threat to every person in this country. As long as he is alive, none of us are safe. This is the time for patriots. Let's talk a little bit more about whether the defendant could have committed this crime. Ma'am. Did you have a profile of this shooter when you began? We did. Senator Pello was shot from over 600 yards away. So we determined that the shooter must have been an experienced marksman. Did you find any evidence that the defendant was a marksman? Yes, sir. By his own admission, the defendant was a sniper in the Army for over eight years and a very decade. Did you ever interview the defendant in connection with this case? Not me personally, but the FBI did, and I was frightened to observe that. Ma'am, do you still have that bullet in front of you? I do, yes. Do you know what kind of bullet it is? I do, yes. This is a 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO bullet, which is used in sniper rifles. When you interviewed the defendant, do you know if he ever answered whether he had access to a kind of that kind of sniper rifle? He said he used that kind of sniper rifle when he was in the military. Based on the defendant's experience as a marksman, the forensic evidence you found in that tweet, what did you do? We determined we had sufficient evidence to arrest the defendant for the murder of Senator Thomas. Thank you. No further questions. Permission to uh, retrieve the exhibits. Um, Please leave it at five and seven. Good morning, Agent. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. I want to start with what kind of events? Because it was pretty high risk, right? Sir. There were thousands of people. That's true. It was an outdoor political rally. It was an appalled area. It was. There were hundreds of buildings in the area. It was. And ma'am, you even told Mr. DePaulo, I don't think you should have to arrange it, right? I did. In my opinion, it wasn't there. Right. You told him. This will not be said. True. That's true. But he insisted. He did. Well, if you don't just work in protection, you're the head of protection for the civil right? I am, yes. This rally was so unsafe that they assigned you to this case, right? Sir, it's not the only rally I've worked, but yes, I was there. But they assigned you the head of protection to keep Mr. Capello's true. I assigned myself to that. It was your job to keep Mr. McCullough's true. It was. And on July 4th, the person that you were supposed to protect was assassinated. He was. And I want to talk about one other one you may have played in this investigation. Because you mentioned that you led also from the Secret Service, right? I did, that's right. 
We have a case where the members of this jury did not make homicide investigations you've done before. This was my first homicide investigation, certainly not my first investigation. Right, you have never done a homicide investigation ever. Not me personally, no. Many of the FBI agents I work with now. And in your first investigative homicide investigation, you're actually leading it from. From the Secret Service end, yes, sir. Then let's talk a little bit more about your first investigation. Starting with the public. Because we can agree, agent, you think this was a pretty thought out problem, right? It was absolutely planned in advance, yes, sir. You think that Mr. Crosby planned to specifically stay at the Senate Hotel, right? I do. But, ma'am, can you find any evidence that Mr. Crosby would know the security information at the Senate Hotel before we checked it? Did you? No, sir. Didn't find any evidence that he would know where the rally would be taking place? Did you? We did find evidence that he knew where the rally was taking place. That's not. Ma'am, you didn't find evidence that he knew that the rally would be in Greenwood House Square in particular. Well, he knew it would be in Philadelphia. I believe the rally was public information. He planned to be there. Right. If he think that this public was out there, it was going to be a rally in Philadelphia. True. That's true. He didn't think there was going to be a rally in Philadelphia in Greenwood House Square, and the public's going to be going to be right in the middle of the square. He didn't say that. Right. Not all those students. No, sir. But let's move on to the one. Because, ma'am, you agree. This wasn't just a random kill, right? Absolutely not. It wasn't an easy shot, was it? No, it wasn't. It would take an experienced marksman to make that shot. Ma'am, there's no second rifle in this world today. No, sir. We believe the rifle was disassembled after the shooting. We weren't able to recover. You believe it was disassembled, but you didn't find any evidence that Mr. Crosby disassembled a gun, did you? That's not exactly true. You didn't find any gunshot residue on his hands? No, we didn't. Gunshot residue on his clothes? No, sir. On the cigarette he so we did find gunshot residue. I'm not asking about the cigarette. I'm asking about his clothes. You didn't find any gunshot residue on his We didn't. Didn't find any gunshot residue on his hands? No, sir. Didn't find gunshot residue in his hotel room? No, we didn't. The only forensic evidence you found was on the cigarette. True? The only forensic evidence we found, that's right. Let's talk about that a little bit more. So, Agent, you agree that when you smoke a cigarette, you'll probably your DNA, right? Absolutely. You agree that when you smoke a cigarette, you'll probably your fingerprint. True. That's right. And when you found this cigarette, it did that like gunshot. Right? It did. The most test that couldn't tell us that cigarette was left there, right? We knew it was left there sometime after July 2nd. Because it hadn't been rained on when the last time the rain was July 2nd, but we couldn't give you an exact date. In between July 2nd and the 4th, that's two possible, three possible days. That that cigarette could have been the true. That's true. So you can't tell us that cigarette was going there on July 3rd, can you? No, sir. Ma'am, I'm sure you talked to a lot of people over the course of this investigation, true. Absolutely. And you didn't find. A single person who said, Well, I saw Mr. Crosby with the rifle. True. We didn't. You didn't find a single person that said, I saw Mr. Crosby on the list of the Senate. True. That's not exactly true. We spoke to a witness who saw Mr. Crosby on his way up to the group, but nobody actually saw him there. That's what we we'll talk about that witness in a second about how to be specific. No one told you I saw Mr. Crosby on the list, did they? No, that's right. So let's talk about that hotel. Because that employee didn't say, well, Mr. Crosby, he was carrying a rifle in his bag, right? No, they saw him with the drawstring backpack, but they didn't see what was inside. Man, a rifle, that's a pretty big gun, right? It is. That witness didn't say, I saw Mr. Crosby carry a gun down the bag, right? No, they didn't. No. They said he was carrying a drawstring bag to go for a small room, right? That's right. She said, I told him he couldn't go up there, right? Right. And then we said, Mr. Crosby just went back downstairs. That's right. About an hour before the shooting, they saw Mr. Crosby go back downstairs. And that was the only eyewitness that saw Mr. Crosby at the hotel at all that day. That's true. That certainly wasn't the only eyewitness you found, was it, Major? No, sir, it wasn't. Because there was actually an eyewitness that saw Mr. Crosby blocks away at the hotel. Sure. 
There was an eyewitness who claimed to have seen Mr. Crosby at the rally, but they gave us a four-hour time window for the shooting, and we couldn't actually confirm whether or not Mr. Crosby was there. There were no photos, no videos, no other eyewitnesses. Ma'am, that's yes to my question. There was a witness that said, I saw Mr. Crosby multiple blocks away at the rally. True? A couple of blocks away in a four-hour time. He said, I'm 100% confident. True? That's what he said. That's true. Mr. Crosby still on That's true. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. Yes, Yes, First agent, Mr. Harper asked you if you found evidence to defend the disposed of a gun. And you said, not exactly. Could you explain what you meant by that? Of course. We did find one piece that we believe was a part of the rifle that killed Senator Capella, something called a trigger bar. And it was disposed of in the trash can of a local restaurant where the defendant said he went for dinner on July 4th. Mr. Harper also asked you about an eyewitness who said that the defendant was at a rally. Did that eyewitness ever say the defendant was at a rally at the time of the shooting? No, sir. They said they saw the defendant sometime between 10 a.m. and 1.45 p.m. They had no idea when in that time range they saw. Thank you. Nothing. Yes, sir. I mean, I'm just going to talk about that trigger for just a second. Because you said you found the thing in the trash can outside of the restaurant. True? That's right. I Ma'am, mean, you didn't find that Mr. Crosby went to that restaurant with his feet, did you? No, he told us he went. Right. Mr. Crosby admitted he went to that restaurant. That's true. And it's your testimony that he just told you that he went to the restaurant where the trigger bar was discovered. Sir, when the FBI interviewed him, they asked him what he did on July 4th. He said he went to that restaurant for dinner. So it's your testimony that he admitted he went to the same restaurant that you claim he discarded the murder weapon. True? A piece of it was in the trash. That's and true. To be clear, it was a piece of that rifle, right? right? Right, a trigger. And that piece did not be nailed. No, we believe it was white. Didn't have fingerprints on it? That's right, no fingerprints. It didn't have anything connecting it to Mr. Cross. That's true. Besides the fact that he had used it. Right, no forensic evidence. Thank you, Thank you, Robin. No, you read the right. Um, yes, yeah, so the witness gave us that back. Sorry, thank you for your testimony. Any further witnesses for the car? <clears throat> no, Your Honor, we've asked our agent. Great. Then, whenever you're ready, you may call your questions. Yes, Your Honor, we've already been talking about this. We just like. He did it, please. We stipulated that it's three minutes. It actually happened even on the eyewitness that saw Mr. Crosby after I was going to run. At this time, we call Mr. Crosby to the Good morning. Good morning. Can you introduce yourself to the members of the jury? Blake Crosby. What do you do for a living? It's a data stand, a driver. Uber lives in his his retirement bank. Mr. Crosby, I want to talk about how he died. I want to address the allegations against you directly. Did you kill Senator Capel? No. Were you on the rooftop of the Senesa Hotel on July 4th? No. Did you even have a right in Philadelphia that day? Absolutely. No. Sir, do you remember when the government showed a tweet that you had posted about a year ago? Yes, Mr. Crosby, did you actually want to kill Mr. Capello when you posted that tweet? Yeah, I don't know. 
was feeling on Twitter the most uh, politician that I did. And I want to talk about how we got Why did anyone else want to be first of all? There were protests. I said, I didn't look like Senator Capello. Protest about a voice man. Where he's staying. Sinesta Hotel. Good. This is probably do you know what I just handed you? Cigarette. Yeah, the guy showed it to me. Same one that I was smoking. Rooftop and said that. Were you here when the agent said that that cigarette was not available for the future? Say that. Is that when you smoke that cigarette? No. I smoked this cigarette in July. I tried to go up to smoke the fourth again. Tell the receptionist, I mean, I could. I didn't. And where did you meet that cigarette box? Left it on the ledge. Let's talk about the day of the crime. Where were you on July 4th? Started off with some estimate. At breakfast, I went to Mr. Capello's route. What time did it start? 1 p.m. There were some other speakers before, but I was there early. How long were you there? Less an hour. Bye. Mr. Crosby, are you aware that any of anyone that might have seen you at that rally on you? Yes, I was there with the protesters. And all supporters were in the front row, were in the back together, holding signs. Somebody had a megaphone. And where were you exactly when that shot ran? You were the back, the other protesters. I'm approaching the with, with a bunch of green markers in the front. Mr. Crosby, what did I just hand you? This looks like a map. The protest was, as well as what you could tell us. Has been changed in any way? It was the same as what I first saw. Your Honor, at this time, we offer you the three. Is that it? Name Jack Humphrey? No, I can't. Full set of the three. Mr. Crosby, can you show the members of this jury where you were on that map? Yeah, so this green square, that's where the Rally was, was kind of right over here by the park. And where's the Sinesta Hotel? It's a few blocks away. It's for a certain If you weren't at that hotel on July 4th, want to talk about why we're in court. Did you ever talk with FBI or Secret Service about this investigation? Yes, sir. I went back home to my fourth went to LA. Three days later, I was contacted by the enemy. What did they say? Your investigation, Senator McCullough's work. I want to walk through everything you told me. Did you tell me that you were in Philadelphia at a boat? Yes. Did you tell him that you didn't own a rifle at the time of the crime? Yes, sir. I haven't touched a rifle since I was back in the army. I told him. Did you tell him that you smoked that cigarette the day? Yes. I told him what I was doing and that I wasn't on the top of the floor. Sir, did you tell him that you didn't do it? Yes. I told him plenty of times that I'm not a shooter. I didn't shoot him. You told them that. How did they respond? The FBI agents. They had proof. They had proof that I wasn't killing them. I told them everything I knew. And I didn't know what else to say. So what did they end up doing? That's 
uh, assassinated Senator Cabell. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Senator. Let's begin by talking about something you said on direct examination. You claim that you were around when the shooting happened, right? I was, sir. At Senator Capello's round, true? I was, sir, a protest. Sir, that was a small round, it wasn't. No, it was a thousand. It was for a presidential campaign, true? That's right. As you said, thousands of people were there, right? Absolutely. People taking photos. Yeah, thanks, sir. People taking videos. Yes, sir. People everywhere, right? Yes. But you even said that you were joined by other protesters holding signs, right? Yes, sir. Sir, you can't tell us any of those protesters' names, can you? No. Not their addresses. Definitely not. Not their phone numbers. No, it's just their protest. Asking for people's names. You can't tell us any of their contact information, sir. And Mr. Crosby, you're not aware of any photos shown by the rack. Not of any recording. But I know. Not of any video. I know. Mr. Crosby, you hear both of these things, right? Yes, sir. You didn't hear Mr. Harper say that any other witnesses were going to have to I don't think so. I want this to be clear for the truth. Of the thousands of people at that rally, you couldn't find one saying you were there at the time of the shooting. Sir, I was there arrest. All right, Mr. Crosby. Let's talk about why that might be. Because on direct examination, you said you told the FBI you spoke that secret, right? Right. That's not true, is it? That is true, sir. Or the FBI actually. The FBI asked you, have you ever smoked that cigarette before, right? right? You said you never have. No, sir. I told you that I smoked a cigarette on July 3rd. It's your testimony when you first asked about that cigarette, you said you smoked it. When I was first asked, I said no. I'm accusing you of assassinating. Eventually, I did tell them that I'd been there July 3rd. Well, let's walk that back. Uh, let's walk through that together. Because the FBI, they actually first asked you, if you ever on the office as a hotel, right? Yeah, they should be a picture. You said you had never been there, right? Right. That was a lie, wasn't it? I said, sir, accusing me of assassination. I initially denied. You lied to the FBI. Uh, yes. And then they asked you about that cigarette, right? They did. And you lied again, didn't you? That's right. You only admitted that you were lying when the FBI told you they had your fingerprints and DNA on the cigarette. That's true. And you'd agree with me, sir. You lied because you didn't want to look guilty. Do I have that right? Like I said, accusing me of murders. Now, you know that cigarette was found next to a bullet, right? Yes, sir. You recognize that bullet, right? I'm sure. Approaching the witness with that one. Mr. Crosby, you recognize that, right? Yeah, they should. Sure yeah. That kind of bullet belongs to the sniper. Sure. That's all. You used that same kind of sniper rifle. During your time in the team, probably did this. Let's talk a little bit more about your experience as a monk. Because you're a trained sniper, aren't you? Certainly was. 
which I did as an investor for eight years. They were also a competitive type. Yeah, they didn't lose the competitions. You didn't just want one competition, you want four. That's right. And Mr. Crosby, you'd agree with me that you could shoot consistently up to 900 yards. Why have that, right? Maybe a decade ago, sure. You heard that this shooting had only happened over 600 yards, right? Yeah, yes. Now that we've talked about the marks, let's talk about the marks. You didn't like Senator Capello very much, did you? No, sir. I agree with his politics. You didn't just disagree with his politics, you thought he was a threat to everybody in this country, correct? You want to debunk a lot of really important programs in the United States. Awesome. And so you flew across the country to protest his campaign. Sure. It's true. It would be right. But Mr. Crosby, protesting wasn't enough, it wasn't. Sure, it's yeah, I get all this disrupt. Mr. Crosby, you wanted Senator Capello dead. No, that's not true. Well, let's talk about what you said before. I'm approaching the witness with what's happening in this well. Mr. Crosby, you just told the jury that you didn't want Senator Capello dead. I would like to hear this in your voice. Please read that if you allow. Thomas R. Capello is a threat to every person in this country. As long as he's alive, none of us will sing. This is the time for patriots. You said that as long as that senator is alive, none of us are saved. Yes or no? Senator Capello is not alive anymore. No, he's not. Yes, yes. Thank you. Go for the violence. Yes. Mr. Crosby, Mr. Forbes was asked why you weren't being armed with FBI investigators. Can you explain why you didn't tell the truth that much? As soon as I got accusing you, he said I was on the said, I was the shooter, he said I could have did this force. And he asked me. If I was on the I said, I would be so scared. To your knowledge, is smoking the mind. Oh, thank you, Mr. Crosby. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Thank you, Mr. Crosby. Thank you, sir. Any further witnesses to the response? Yes, Your Honor. Permission to retrieve you to the same question. The marksman hit his mark. It's July 4th, 2022. And high on the rooftop of the Sinesco Hotel, Mr. Crosby is looking back. He takes a drag from the city. He's got a clear line of sight, a good angle. Nothing's blocking his view of Senator Hell. So that day, Mr. Crosby kneels down. He takes out a sniper rifle, and that marksman lines up his line of sight with his mark. The forehead of Senator Tom Capella. That marksman hit his mark, and that's how he charged him with murder. That means as the government, we had a burden of murder. We had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant killed Senator Capello with malice of hope. Simply put that he did so intentionally. And we met our burden with three simple facts. What he did, why he did it, and how he did it. 
I want to walk through each of those. Let's start with fact one. What he did. You heard today that there was a cigarette found on the rooftop of the Sinestro Hotel with the defendant's fingerprints and DNA on it. But it didn't just have those things, that gunshot residue next to it, too, and was found near a sniper rifle bullet that matched the sniper rifle bullet that killed Senator Wittow. Now, I expect Mr. Harper to come before you and tell you we don't know when the cigarette was put on the roof. Smoking is not a crime. But think about the circumstantial evidence that surrounds the cigarette. Because you heard it was found on a ledge. And if it was really there for two days, do you think Wick would have blown it off? Do you think a different gunman would have knocked the cigarette off? That doesn't make any sense. That cigarette was there, gunshot residue, and the defendant's forensic evidence on it because he fired this bullet right at him. But that's not all. Because we also know the defendant's lie about whether he was on that. You heard that when he was first interviewed by the FBI, he said, I've never been there before in my life. I've never touched that cigarette. So that has to make you wonder why. Why did the defendant lie? Well, there's an easy answer to that question, which is that he lied because he thought it made him look guilty. You heard that on his cross-examination. But then that question has to make you really think. How would you know that being on the rooftop of the Sinesta Hotel and smoking a cigarette would make him look guilty if he didn't do it? That's a lie that only makes sense if he did. Which means we can move to fact number two. Why the defendant did? Because you heard from a tweet today, and you're going to be able to review this tweet when you go in evidence. Senator Capello is a threat to every person in this country. As long as he is alive, none of us are safe. Let's be blunt. This is a death threat. Mr. Crosby can take the stand and claim that he didn't want Senator Capello dead, but we all want to feel safe. This is motive for making Senator Capello his mark. This is proof. Which means we can move to fact number three now. Because this wasn't just any crime. A marksman committed this crime. A sniper from over 600 feet away with a sniper. And we know the defendant had the means to commit this crime. He used the same type of sniper rifle he was in the military. He knew how to use it. And he had the ability to use it too. You heard he could fire consistently from 900 yards away, and this shooting took place over 600. Mr. Harper said at the beginning of this trial, reasonable doubt means that you can't have another reasonable explanation for this crime. And the fact is, the defendant was in the location of the crime, with the ability to commit the crime, with the with his forensics at the scene of the crime. Is it reasonable to think all of those things are just coincidences? Yes. The marksman hit his call. But in response to that, defense counsel says that Mr. Crosby has an alibi. And this is what's really striking about this case, because what he's claiming should be the most airtight alibi in the world. He's claiming he was in a crowd, a crowd of people, a crowd of people taking photos, taking videos, a crowd who should be able to say that he was there at the time of the shooting. But how many people took that stand? and said, I saw this report, I was with him when the shooting occurred. A grand total blow. Zero. The defense, they don't have a word. You don't get anything. But when the defendant tells you a story, you're allowed to ask whether it makes sense. And right now, his story doesn't. I mean, really think about it. Think about this. How many people are sitting in this crowd right now? If you were accused of a murder, any one of these people could say that you were here right now. And Mr. Crosby, he's not just saying it was this many people, he's saying it was thousands, and not one of them can corroborate his story. 
An alibi isn't an alibi if you have to take the defense as well. When you go back to deliberate, you're going to be shown a jury room. And it boils this case down to a very simple question. On count one of murder, how do you find guilty or not? And when you're looking at this verdict form, I don't want you to just think about any one piece of evidence. I want you to think about all of the evidence taken together. The threat, the experience, the forensics, the bullet, the knowledge of the site, like all of those facts taken together creates the summation of the evidence that proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant killed Senator Trump. There's no other reasonable explanation. The marksman hit his marker, so we ask him to mark guilty and find him so. Thank you. Yes. If it's for <laughs> Mr. Farnsworth, members of the jury, they couldn't find the shoot, but they need an answer. How about you? Secret Service agent Morgan DeVico was assigned to protect Thomas Frick. She's sitting down with him, planning his rap in Philadelphia. She's like, not safe. There's too many people. There's too many buildings. There's too many windows. I can't protect you. A few months later, she realizes she's right. There were too many people. There were too many buildings. There were too many windows. She couldn't find the shoe. So then, she needed to find an answer. And here we are today with her with Mr. Ross Punchwell. And after hearing that that the government has put on today, I'm sure you must be asking how in the world did we do it? Because you think in a murder case, well, the prosecution put out a murder life. They don't. You would think if this was an assassination, they would have some hard evidence of a plan. They didn't. You would think that if Mr. Crosby was a suspect, they would have to have had someone sit on that stand and tell me that I saw him shoot that gun from the top of the roof, but that person didn't testify. They didn't testify because they don't exist. And when the prosecution tells you a story that sounds great about a marksman that never misses, they can't just tell you that that story is true. They have to prove it. They can't ask you to take their word for their story. Because I'm going to make one thing very clear. Mr. Crosby didn't have to find any alibi witnesses. He didn't have to find any evidence. If you question, you can't tell us their contact info. You couldn't find people that saw now, that might sound like my cross the agent, but that was actually Mr. Quartz was cross of a criminal defendant that has no burden of proof in a criminal case. No, these prosecutors do. They have to prove every single element of their trial. Or likely, or likely, they have to show you that their story is beyond a reasonable doubt. Said it once, and I'll say it again. It's the heaviest burden in our legal system, and it's not one we met today, members of the jury. Because the burden wasn't to prove that Mr. Crosby didn't like Thomas the Man. Their burden wasn't even to prove that Mr. Crosby could have shot their gun, shot that gun. Their burden was to prove that Mr. Crosby killed Thomas. So let's walk through some of the evidence that we've heard today. 
Let's start with this cigarette. Now it's true. Mr. Crosby was on the roof of the Sinesta Hotel that wasn't on the 4th of July. He was there the day before. And you know, because he was smoking a cigarette. Now, I find it interesting that Mr. Barnes was like, no one was able to say that he was actually at the rally. He came to the legal works of all members of the jury. You don't have to take his word for it because I have an affidavit right here from someone said, someone said, it. that they saw Mr. Barnes. And what did the plaintiff for the prosecution for? Just so that Mr. Crosby was on that roof on the 4th of July. A witness that saw him try to go smoke another cigarette and then come back downstairs. Does that sound like a witness that actually saw a crime? And a witness is not any of someone that saw something, and that witness is someone that saw all the crime. And they have a grand total of zero. It doesn't need a drug roll because they're the prosecution. And they should have had They didn't. Sure. Mr. Crosby, he wasn't born with that. I don't know. Mr. Crosby, there's no why. Look around, members of the jury. This is why. This is what he was scared of. Special agents tell him, you killed the senator. You were on that roof. You had a rifle. Nothing of the sort happened. And he tells them that and they say, I don't know. You got it. And a year later, they're in court doing the exact same thing. They can ask you to take their word that their story is true. They have and you haven't heard any evidence that Mr. Crosby had access to a gun, that he was on the rooftop, that he wasn't at the rally. Think about what they're asking you to believe, members of the jury. They want you to believe that Mr. Crosby was such a criminal mastermind that he avoided the detection of the FBI, the Secret Service, disassembled a gun that they never found, but was so stupid to leave his own DNA at the crime scene. No. They can't have it both ways. Either he's a criminal mastermind or he's innocent. When you go back in the deliberation room, take a look at things. Does it have the evidence for you to make that happen? Because they couldn't find the shooter, but they needed an answer. So they picked one. And don't let Mr. Farnsworth pick your answer in this trial. Find Mr. Crosby not guilty. Thank you. Goodbye. There's a difference between proof beyond all of that and proof beyond a reasonable proof. Because Mr. Harper, he's not appealing to your reason. Think about all of the evidence that matches this defendant perfectly. The fact that I really saw the defendant going to the rooftop just before the shooting happened. The fact that he had the skill and experience he needed to commit this crime, the fact that he needed a death threat before this crime, the fact that his DNA and fingerprint was found on a cigarette with gunshot residue on it next to the same type of bullet he used in the military, assuming that every single one of those things is a coincidence. That's not what he He found the shooter, and he showed him the answer. The marksman hit his mark. Find him guilty. Thank you.